الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار Indeed all praise and thanks belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as such we praise him we thank him we seek his help and we seek his forgiveness whoever Allah guides there's none that can misguide whoever he allows to go astray there's none that can guide and I bear witness that there's nothing worthy of our worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone without any partner or associate and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave of Allah and his messenger and the seal of all the prophets. And indeed the best of speech is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the best of guidance and example is that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of matters are the newly introduced ones into Islam. The newly introduced religious matters into the deen of Allah. They are cursed innovations. And every innovation is a bid'ah and every bid'ah is a source of misguidance. And every misguidance leads to the hellfire. We ask Allah to protect us and our families from that. My dear brothers in Islam, all of us, either we're working on a daily basis or we're dealing with money on a daily basis. But the reality is that one day, all of us, we're going to leave the money behind. We're going to leave behind our wealth, our possession, our assets, and so on. The question comes, what happens to our money once we leave and depart from this world? This is the topic of our khutbah today, inshallah ta'ala. And it's something which we have spoken about in the past, but a reminder is necessary. It is something which I had of, of a recent conversation with a brother, and these questions were posed. And it shows that there is other misunderstandings, and people need clarity on it as well. Unfortunately, when it comes to the issues of inheritance in Islam, Muslims, they fall into disputes. It could be family disputes about where the wealth should be going and heading, who should take this, who should take this percentage and whatnot. All of this is in fact already in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something which no one can change and amend, but something that we, we have to follow. Allah subhanahu has placed the rules for them in his book subhanahu wa ta'ala. The issue is when we don't know the rules, we fall into disputes. So what happens to our wealth? There's four things that happens or that happen to our wealth when we pass away. The first thing that happens is the funeral expenses. The funeral costs, whatever is related to that, whether it is the grave, the burial plot, and other expenses that come with it. The second thing is the debts. The debts which need to be paid. If the person who died he has any debts, the money has to be taken from his wealth to pay out those debts. The third thing is the wasiya or the bequest or a sadaqah which a person intends to leave behind on a specific affair and he can do this he can uh, appoint somebody to give one third of his wealth or less and we'll talk about that inshallah ta'ala this is the wasiya and the fourth thing is the mirath itself the laws of inheritance and these laws they have rightful inheritors okay not anyone can, can come and take from that wealth but Allah Azza wa Jal he has specified who takes what exactly so we want to go over these things one by one, inshallah ta'ala. The first of these four is the funeral expenses. Unfortunately, this is something that we have to deal with. It exists and it's not cheap. The average cost goes from 5,000 to 10,000 or even more. And then that depends on where the burial plot is as well. 
So there's many fees that goes with that. But who is going to pay these costs and these fees? The person who died. That is the person who has to pay them. Meaning we take it from his wealth. We take it from his money to pay off these um, costs. All of these expenses, they are covered by the deceased himself. Unless somebody else pays it, of course. And if there's not enough in, the, in that wealth, then people have to step forward from family members, from community members, to cover this, this expense. The second issue that the money of the deceased is related to is the debts. If the person who passed away has any debts that he did not pay, then it has to be taken from his wealth again before anything else is done with it. So first, the funeral expenses, then we deal with the debts. Unfortunately, many people, they go into debts and they go into them unnecessarily. Just because they want to buy something nicer. So they go into debt for that. They want to buy a nicer car, live in a nicer house, so they go into debt for all of these things. But then they end up living in debt. And they die in debt. And this is the case with many people living in this country and in the West in general. That they die without paying their debts ever. Now, we have no issue with debts in origin. It is okay to take a debt if you need it. It's not encouraged to take a debt, even though it's halal. It's not encouraged at all. If you can manage without taking debts, live your life without them as much as you can. You should avoid it. Some people take debts, and they take them with interest-based uh, issues with it. Basically, riba is involved as well. This is another issue, which adds to the issue itself. It's another big problem, which we have to be cautious of. And just to show the seriousness of the debt itself, the Prophet Ali والسلام, he would not pray the janazah of a person who passed away and yet he had not paid away his debts. He would order somebody else to, pay, to pray that prayer. But as, as the leader of the community, he would not do that sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this was enough as a warning to show us the seriousness of not settling our debts before we pass away. The third thing is al-wasiyya or the bequest. Al-wasiyya, it is something which uh, the deceased or one who is about to die, he has the opportunity to instruct his family members or someone else to do away with some of his wealth that he wants to give away as a sadaqah, for example. And he can do this, but the maximum is one-third. cannot give more than that. One-third is the maximum. So say if you had $9,000 uh, in your account and you passed away for example and that's that's what remains after the funeral expenses after the debts are covered 9,000 remains 3,000 of that you can give or it can go to uh, La basically where it is specified that this should go to a specific organization for example it can go to a charity it could go to a specific person but it has to be a non-inheritor the person cannot be from those people who will inherit from you so in many cases there's people who they become Muslim, but they have family members which are not Muslim. This wealth can go to them if they want. They can give it to their non-Muslim family members or relatives. Because the inheritors, the Prophet he says, a Muslim does not inherit a non-Muslim. And a non-Muslim cannot, uh, cannot inherit a Muslim. This is when it comes to the mirah itself. So the wasiya is one opportunity for the person if he wants to give away to his mother who is not Muslim, and he's about to pass away, for, for example, or he has a son or a daughter who is not Muslim, he wants to give them part of his money, he can do that in the wasiya. So, uh, one third, the Prophet says, he says, one third, even that, it is a lot. He says, والسلام, so this is the maximum limit. And in fact, the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, والسلام, they, they would advise that it should always be less than one-third. If you, that is, if you do decide to leave behind a wasiyah. Because in addition to this, the Prophet وسلم, he says, وَرَثَتَكَ وَرَثَتَكَ He said, it is, it is better that you leave your inheritors rich, meaning with money, not leave them begging in need of asking people. So if you don't have a lot of money, there's no need to even leave a wasiyah. To behind, meaning to share one third of this wealth of yours to give it away to somebody else who is not even a non non inheritor. So it is the fact that if you do decide to leave it, then make sure you also write it down and you have witnesses in that 
regard so there is no confusion when death takes place Allah ta'ala a'la wa alam hadha wa alhamdulillah bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah my dear brothers we, we covered three things that happen to your wealth after you pass away the first of them we mentioned is that the wealth should go towards funeral expenses secondly it goes to debts if there is any debts to be settled and thirdly towards the bequest and sadaqah which is known as uh, instruction in the wasiya to be given and we said that the maximum is one third now we come to the fourth and final matter and that is to the laws of inheritance itself these are the proportions which the inheritors are going to receive and these portions are in fact uh, quite fixed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so again it's not something that people can change and do what they want with it they cannot fix it according to what they like so they cannot change it they cannot amend it it has to stay in the way which Allah Azawajal has ordained it in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these laws they are not necessarily easy to understand all the time especially when it comes to different types of scenarios with family members and the inheritors and when the issue comes forward and you have to deal with it you cannot always find people to help you to divide these portions properly you cannot always go to the people who are available from the scholars who know these uh, ayat about the uh, the mirah properly to explain it to you but what you can do now and it's something which has become very easy for us you go online a specific website alhamdulillah may allah reward the brothers who set it up you can calculate it right now and it gives you the results in in a split of a second it basics basically it figures out what do you have is, is your brother is alive your sisters are, are alive your mother father you have any children who are alive right and then you fill it up it's a spreadsheet and it gives you the results right away you know exactly what percentage goes to who if you were to pass away today so this is very easy alhamdulillah nowadays it is easy to to figure it out we just need to know where to go this website is called inheritancecalculator.net again it's not .com it's .net it will it's very simple like i said just fill in the spreadsheet and you will see the results and it gives you exactly who is eligible to receive it exactly so alhamdulillah this is something easy to deal with nowadays if you do not find the right people who can help you to sort it out especially in hard times some common issues in regards to the shares and these inheritance laws is that some people they think that these laws are not just or they think they're not fair or they're not equal we say even though they are not equally distributed they are just because islam came to establish justice and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is he is al-alim al-hakim he is the all-knowing the all-wise subhanahu wa ta'ala and he knows what he legislates he knows that is best for what he has created Allah is kind to, towards his creation so he knows exactly what he has created and what should be going where, should, where it should be going and this includes our wealth and what is fixed as a proportion of that wealth if we don't understand why certain matters are ordained a certain way then for us this is a test as Muslims because we accept it we, we accept it because it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Quran is from Allah it is the speech of Allah kalamu Allah azza wa jal once we believe this I mean, we should not have a problem accepting what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says and if we were to reject one ayah one ruling from the Quran then this would show our limitless understanding that we have to begin with and it will render our faith void we will lose our Islam if we were to question the Quran if we were to question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah is not asked about what he does Allah is not asked what the people will be asked about what they do and what they act upon we are Muslim we accept the deen of Allah Azawajal. we accept the rule and the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is what makes us Muslim if we were to reject it and have doubts in it then it defeats the word itself Islam and Muslim means to submit so we will not be submitting to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated and certain matters of the deen they do become controversial at times and a person may have doubts and weak faith so he asks he asks and questions what is the wisdom behind this what is the wisdom behind that why did Allah mention this 
Why can a person marry up to four wives, for example? And so on and so forth. They ask and ask and ask, and they, their whole religion becomes asking about these matters, which become controversial and doubtful for him. Then he is at the, at the brink of losing his faith altogether. As Muslims, my dear brothers, we are believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when it comes to the speech of Allah and His commands, we believe that it is there for a divine wisdom, which only Allah knows best. The reason is Allah said, but the wisdom, sometimes we can derive it, we can understand it, sometimes we don't understand it. And that's because we are limited people, limited creation. We don't understand everything. Our, our attitude should be, if Allah said it, this is enough for us. This is sufficient for us to accept and move on. And we have to be very careful because if we say that the laws of inheritance are not just, they're not fair, then essentially we're saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just. Or that the Quran has mistakes in it. And if a person says, says such statements, then he's at the risk of losing his Islam and nullifying his faith completely. Not a Muslim anymore. So this is very dangerous. Another common issue when it comes to inheritance, some Muslims, they try to deprive their daughters or their sisters from their haq in the mirat, from the rights that belong, from what they're entitled to take from the inheritance shares. So just because a daughter is married off, living with her family and her husband, doesn't mean she's not entitled to anything. That's not the case. Also, if you were to take it away from her, we are stealing it from her. This is theft. And theft has a heavy punishment in Islam. If you don't get it here, you're going to meet Allah Azza wa Jal with it. You're going to have to pay for it somehow. So this is very serious. Another issue is that sometimes people, and this is common among some Muslims, they play emotional games with their sisters or with their daughters, if you like, to the point where they force them to give up their share. They force them. And I'm telling you, we cannot do that at all. This is the deen of Allah Azza It is just. If Allah has ordained something for her, it is for her. And we cannot deprive her of it at all. This is a big wrong. It's a big mistake to do. So something for us to be cautious of. And we cannot even pressure our daughters or our sisters, whoever they may be from our family members, to put them under stress and pressure to give up some of their shares. No, not at all. If they want to give it up willingly, they can do that if they want. But no, you cannot put them under any duress. And this is something that we need to know. And no one has a right to tell people what to do with their share. They can do with it as they please. Another scenario is where the parents, they deprive their kids of the mirah. Some of their kids, I should say. Because some of their kids, they were not nice to them. Or they were disobedient kids. Or they were uh, sinful kids. So they say, no, we're not going to give uh, Muhammad anything. We're going to give Ibrahim everything. Right? Because he's not a good boy. Right? This is not how it works in Islam. Even though he was not, you know, the best, the best person, and he did dhulm or whatever, he, he, he fell short towards his parents, it doesn't mean that the parents have, a right, have a, any right to deprive their son or daughter, for that matter, of any share because they feel like they don't deserve it because they're not, they're not good enough. They were not good enough throughout their life. So these are some of the reminders I wanted to share. And surely... Death, the death is going to, to reach us, whether we like it or not. And we're going to leave behind everything that we have. All of our possessions, all, all of our money and wealth. And Islam being such a comprehensive system, it has given us the guidance on how we should implement everything in our life at every stage of our life. Every stage, including when we die and after we die. And preparing and leaving a will or a testament, instructions, of what happens to your money after you die, especially in a non-Muslim country like this, it's very important. Because if, if there is no will, there is no executor of that will present, then the state, the country, they can do what they want with those shares of your wealth. They will distribute it as they see fit. So we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. right? Legally, if you have to make sure by drafting this uh, will by a lawyer, having it legalized and everything notarized. This is a very good idea. And we should do that. Because we don't know when we die who's going to be around us. And who's going to take care of our affairs. And our money that we left behind. And we want to make sure it is distributed in accordance to the Islamic way. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, if we fall short, 
then we are afraid that Allah is going to take us into accountability for doing that. So this is what I want to share. Allah Ta'ala A'lam wa A'lam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He knows best. We ask Allah for a good ending and that He forgives us our shortcomings. Allahumma Ameen. Allahumma Arina Al-Haqqa Haqqan Warzukna Tiba'a Wa Arina Al-Batila Batilan Warzukna Istinaba Allahumma Ya Munqalib Al-Qulubi Wa Al-Absar Thabit Qulubna Ala Deenik Allahumma Ya Munqalib Al-Qulubi Wa Al-Absar Thabit Qulubna Ala Deenik Allahumma Ya Munqalib Al-Qulubi Wa Al-Absar Thabit Qulubna Ala Deenik Allahumma Tawafana Muslimin Allahumma Tawafana Muslimin وَالْحِقْنَا بِالصَّالِحِينَ يَا رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ إِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى أَمْرَكُمْ بِأَمْرٍ فَبَدَأَ فِي بِنَفْسِهِ فقال جل من قال عليما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد هذا وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين واقيموا الصلاه